like to thank everybody <coughs> for attending the meeting tonight and welcome everybody to the special called meeting work session this January the 12th, 2020. <coughs> uh, roll call shows that all members are present in County 4 and we're ready to start. The first thing on our agenda is to discuss a district wide raise. I'd like to real quick say that, uh, you know, this is our first meeting with everybody together, and uh, I'd like to let everyone know, and, and what a school board does is try to make the best decisions they can with students in mind. So if we, there's nothing I don't think that we can sit down and not work through that we may hit, may see or, or come across our desk that we can't just sit down and talk about and keep the best interest of students at heart and uh, make the best decisions we can. So I want to welcome everybody on board, guys, and and uh, ready to go ahead and get started. Would you guys prefer to discuss the budget first or the raise first? Because Tiffany, if you've got a presentation laid out, you go with your presentation. Yeah, that's probably better. Yeah. I can, but they can. So just to kind of get to know them, uh, my name is Tiffany Warks Campbell, and I'm the Director of Finance, and I've been here for 16 years within the district. And then I'll just have each of them come up and just kind of tell what they do in their department and introduce themselves. So first up, we have Michael Ellis. Mike seems a little nervous, but he's really not. Michael, approximately how many substitutes do we have? Do you, I mean, just approximately. I know you're not going to. I'd say about a, probably about 150, um, a lot less than that that gets consistently used. Yeah. So we we'll probably have about 150 mm -hmm. that we have to do. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. And uh, that's, that's me. And then next, uh, Bree is going to come up and talk about certified. Different than what the state 
So, Angel, you gave me some numbers today of, of how many employees we have. Does that include substitutes? That's our full time. So, okay. Okay. Hey, next was, up we have Jamie Harmon. I'm going to hold it. Okay. Um, I'm Jamie Harmon, and I've been here for about seven years. Um, I'm originally from Moorhead, but I'm a Floyd County transplant. Um, I did payroll for about five years until we got the two newbies behind me. Um, I'm within two years of doing the fun two budgets, um, which include all of your state, local, and federal funds. Um, I do the additional reporting, request, and monitoring on a monthly and uh, basis. Um, I also um, help the schools with their sweep account funds. Um, that is funds that are not student generated and kept at the school and they can sweep these up to use at their discretion. Uh, and then um, any local donations that the schools would get, I also help them set up a, a grant code to keep um, track of that here at the board and then I also still do a lot of the quarterly reports but they just come in a different fashion um, such as Medicaid and CDIP and then um, any revisions and then um, I also take care of daily receipts and deposits. Wes, is there any way we can improve the, the, the quality of the sound? John Earl's wife just texted and said he can't hardly hear and that John Earl, can you hear us? I can hear you barely, sir. Okay, next up we have Michael Long. Hello, I'm Michael Long. I've been here since 2006, and uh, I work in purchasing. I enter and approve requisitions up to $500, and then we convert them into purchase orders. We do roughly 5,000 purchase orders a year. Uh, we maintain the permissions and roles with approval processes. Uh, we do local bidding, creating the bid specs and the tab for the board to vote on. For example, fiscals, auto parts, facilities maintenance, etc. cetera. Uh, we also do fixed assets. We enter all the new fixed assets into the module. We surplus them and run depreciation on them. There's over 15,000 active fixed assets. I also do the food service revenues, record the journal entries for food service deposits, and the monthly school activity reports. Uh, we review them monthly and uh, create the report for the board meetings. And we also do the uh, daily deposit ledger. Tiffany, could you share your, your PowerPoint with uh the board members once you're completed this one right here yeah, yeah. okay and last up but not least we have angie bentley <laughs> well i've been in the school system since 1959 that was just a student first grade <laughs> Uh, but I do accounts payable and uh, quite a few invoices that we put in. Uh, this is just a little overview of what you're going to see on your bills and claims. Uh, I try to keep them separate, like I try to do general fund under one warrant. You'll see I'll give you several different warrants. Uh, I do special revenue funds, transportation, food service, and fund 21, which is the school activity money that's swept down. Uh, we pay them weekly now. I don't know if you remember seeing it, but you get those invoices on Wednesday. Tiffy sent them to I sent them to her. She sends them out to you all. And you've got like the Friday to approve them. If you have any questions, feel free. Angie, can you care to explain why we do that now? 
Uh, it's just to, uh, let's see, with uh, general fund, I mean, not, uh, what is it, uh, food service, GFS. They were giving us a discount. They get a discount, right, if we do it. And we get that kickback, you know, and that money comes back, and mm -hmm. it goes right back into food service funds. And just the same thing. versus before it was once a month. And you know, this will stop late fees and stop invoices not being paid timely because if they weren't in by a certain time for us to get to the board, then they had to wait a whole nother month for the next board meeting. So this just gave the schools more flexibility so we can pay more frequent to the vendors. That's the way you explained it to us in the beginning, yeah. why mm -hmm. you wanted to do it. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm board member for 20 years. I read everything on the on the three four. I never pay any not too much attention on this because that's the one hard to understand. Sometimes it's so simple. I never done. I try to do it a couple of times. Mike helped me, but I quit. So I do new board order. I hope they do it. Wonderful, they can do it. But I don't think anybody did until the last one. The invoices and bills. I don't think any money is it. And something else, it's, it's less overwhelming to you all when you can see them weekly sent to mm -hmm. you versus, you know, right. 30 pages sent to you with all the, the bills. 400, 400 pages. So, um, and I'm going to explain that a little detail um, or have Angie explain it when I get to that um, after my presentation. I'm just going to try to go through the monthly report so you can see what, you're, what you see on the mm -hmm a board agenda each month, go over the warrants, let Angie explain those, that way you can see what you're looking at, because I know there's been some confusion in the past, because it tallies mm -hmm. what we paid for the month, and then the next page right. has them broken out to individual payments. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about that in a, in a little bit also. And once before, uh, before we start breaking these down weekly, it was nothing for you all to get a thousand invoices to look at exactly. for a board meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, it just makes it a little bit better. Uh, we do do prepays, which is people's travel. Uh, ut utilities are always pay, uh, anything like that. And we do those on every Monday. I just have to have them in my hands. <laughs> and that's all. Okay, and that was just the little bit of get to know finance. Good job. I'm glad you did that, Tiffany, so we know everybody that way. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of the, you know, the, the faces. If we do have a question, we can contact the right person instead of bothering everybody. Do we have a copy of that, Tiff? Okay, so this is just an overview of MUNIS, which is our accounting system that we use. All school systems uh, use this in the state of Kentucky. Hey, Mike, come up here and run this thing for me. 
Come up here and flip through. Anybody? Other than Mike, maybe? Okay. That way she can present instead. So this is just a, a, an overview of MUNIS, the system that we use. We're going to look at the account structure in MUNIS and then what reports that we can generate from MUNIS. So within MUNIS, you have the general ledger, the financial statements. This is where we do our budgets, accounts payable, purchasing with the requisitions, payroll, personnel, uh, miscellaneous cash receipts, and fixed assets. So the design of the account code structure um, tells a framework for financial management, uh, serves all different types of school sizes. You can adapt it to the school needs, conform to GAP, full disclosure, and then there's an audit trail. So anything that's put into the system, there's an audit trail of who did what in the system. Okay, so what this is, MUNIS is a, breaks down by funds. These are the different funds that we have within MUNIS. When I present the budget, my main focus is always on the general fund. That's what you'll hear me talk about the most. So your fund one is your general fund. Fund two is your special revenue, which is all your grants, state grants, local grants, federal grants, uh, any donations that we've set up as a local grant for the schools to spend. Fund 21 is the district activity fund, which is the sweep account that Jamie was referring to. Fund 25 is a new fund, and you'll see that in your balance sheet, but this is something that is required now by GASB 84. They want to see this at the board level, but this is the money that is actually out in the schools in their school and their EPES system. It's not money that we have in our account here. The money's all at the schools, and this is just a reporting that KDE and the auditors want to see now in at the district reporting. And that's what they use to purchase t-shirts for their staff or lunches, am I correct? Yes. Yeah, your school activity funds are used. It can be spent on staff, whereas any money generated by students cannot be. No, that's that's your fund 21 is what that is. Fund 25 is the brand new one. Gotcha. And that's just reporting anything they spend, student activities that they spend at the school, if it's on their athletics, if it's on their students. Uh, that will be reported at the end of the year and fund 25. But I just want to make a point that that's not actually cash that we have in our district fund here. It's separate at each of the schools. See, that's what I would call the school activity fund, what you're calling district activity fund. Right. School activity right. fund, district activity right. fund, sweep account, correct. Okay. okay, your fund 310 is capital outlay. Fund 320 is the building fund. Fund 360 is construction fund. 400 is debt service. That's where we pay our bond payments from. And that is just a flow through account. All we budget in there is what we need for bond payments. Uh, fund 51 is your food service. And then fund 52 is after school and child care. So this is your after school programs at Allen, Prestonsburg, and the May Valley's uh, child care program that they operate. And then 7,000 is fiscal agency. So this right here, when you're reading budget reports, this gives you a breakdown of each school and their school code, okay? So anything 000 is district-wide. 001 is central office. And you'll see that later in reports. But if you're ever curious, that's a breakdown of every school and what their school code is. The next is the account structure of expenditures. So this is the expenses. And then I also gave you this too that breaks it down even more it's called expenditures series codes 
that gives you more detail on the object codes and what falls within those different object codes. So when you're looking at your report, say the monthly financial report, anything in 01 is going to be salaries. Anything in the 02 codes is going to be employee benefits. In the 03 codes, that's professional services. 04 codes, property services. The 05 codes are other services. 06 codes are your supplies and materials. 07 codes is property. 08 codes is just miscellaneous. And 09 codes are other uses of funds. But like I said, if you just refer back to this white sheet, I gave you a breakdown of a lot of our expenses that fall within those series of codes. Okay, so the next account structure is dealing with revenue. Revenue is broken down in codes also. So when you're viewing your monthly report, anything that begins with a one is local money that we receive. Anything that's with a three, that's our state money that we receive. That's where your seek money would fall into. If it begins with a four, that's federal money that we receive. And if it begins with a five, that just falls into the other category. Okay, org codes is something that we deal with on a daily basis. And what that does is it breaks down to where we can locate where the purchase is or where the revenue belongs to. So when you look at a balance sheet, your org code is going to be a two-digit code. When you're looking at revenues, the org code is a three-digit code. And when we deal with expenditures, that's a seven-digit code. And that code's broken down by the unit, fund, and key code. Definitely. Can you give just example how the two-digit, how three-digit, can you give just example? Well, the next page, I'm going to give like an how example the of two, the how three, and how the seven. Well, let me get to the next page, and I'll, I'll show you this one. And then if you need more help after that, then I'll, I'll get the balance sheet out to show you. So this is the account structure that I was talking about, the six-digit code. So your first section of numbers here, the seven-digit code. That's the org code that I was just talking about for expenditures, okay? Your org code breaks down. Your first three is the location, those locations that I gave you earlier with all the schools, district-wide, central office. If you move to the next code, the two, that tells you what fund. So if you see a one, that's fund one. If you see a two, that's fund two. The next part of your org code is a key code, which breaks down by function if it's instruction, um, if it's maintenance. It's, it's different things, and I'll, I've got a, a breakdown of those two on your monthly report for you to have. The next part of this, 0610, that's our object code. That tells us what we're purchasing, and that it's on that white sheet that I gave you, the, the breakdown of how those codes fall within to the categories. The last four digits, that's a project number. So a lot of times if you see four digits, then we we purchase something out of a grant. This question mark at the end, KDE switched it to where we used to go by numbers by the fiscal year that we were on, and then they switched to letters. So right now within fiscal year 21, all of our grants are in with a G and then we'll move forward you know, every fiscal year. So does that help you on the, okay. So the type of reports that MUNIS can uh, produce, you have your balance sheet, uh, annual budgets, your annual financial report, monthly financial reports, 
year-to-date budget reports and project-to-date budget reports. And what those are, that's your grant monies. Okay, so the balance sheet, and I'll have an example of this later. Um, the balance sheet summarizes the financial position of the district as of a specific date. It has three accounts, assets, liabilities, and fund balance. The formula for the balance sheet is assets equals liability plus fund balance. Each fund in Munis has a balance sheet. So when you see, and that balance sheet is on your agenda every month, when you see that, it's broken down fund by fund by fund. Okay, next, the annual budgets. Uh, the budget is a plan of financial operation for the district, provides for planning, controlling, and evaluating the activities of the school system. The annual budgets are presented by fund, revenue, and expenditure by function at a high object level code. And when I say high object level code, it doesn't break it into 0610 supplies, 0616 food. It just puts 06XX. It lumps all those into one series of codes. The annual budgets, the draft must be reviewed by the board by January 31st. The tentative budget must be approved by the board by May 31st. And the final working budget must be approved by the board by September 30th. Tiff, will you have the draft ready by the 25th meeting? I will. Normally, in the past, we've always kept the draft budget as what it is now. Gotcha. Just because there's so many uncertainties at this time, and then your um, budget in May is the most accurate we can get at that time when, once we get the staffing for the school. Um, your annual and monthly reports. Munis can generate standardized reports on revenues received and expenditures that have occurred in the same format as the annual budget reports. There's an annual financial report, or the AFR, and there's monthly financial reports. Year-to-date budget reports. The MUNIS system can also generate activity reports, and it can be very detailed or summarized um, as the user defines that. Um, a lot of times we'll have a family resource center and they have to turn in reports and they need details of every transaction. So, I mean, this report can get as detailed as you, uh, as you want it to. And then you have the project budget report same kind of information, it's just dealing with their grants. And that's all I have for the presentation, and I'm going to go just start explaining some stuff as far as the reports and how they're broken down. Does anybody have any questions so far? So I've highlighted, this is your monthly financial report. And I'm not sure why the colors are different on this than what I actually have. Uh, but like I was talking, it, this report breaks down by fund. So you'll see here at the top, 
highlighted is general fund, okay? Below that, it will first list all the receipts. It will then break those receipts down into local taxes or local revenue. And I've got that highlighted there, revenue from local sources. Okay. Then it goes to revenue from state sources. Then we move to revenue from federal sources. And then also on the bottom of page three, you've got other receipts. So that's kind of how it breaks down the revenues. It gives you the month to date of the revenues that we've collected. It combines your local, state, federal, and other. It combines those and tallies. If you'll move to the, to the right of that, it's year to date. That's what we've collected this fiscal year in revenue for general fund. If you'll move on to the right of that, that is the budget appropriated. That's what we budgeted at the beginning of the school year for revenues for the general fund. And if you move to the left, that will show you this period last year. So this report is as of December. It will show you in comparison how we stand of what we collected last year, the previous fiscal year in the same month. Does anybody have any questions on that? I know it's a lot of information, sorry, but I'm just trying to make sure everybody can understand what they're, what they're seeing every month. So if you move on down, whoa, I just made this really big, uh, but then you move to your expenditures, okay? Your expenditures are broken down by function, okay? So what I try to do is I try to highlight every function for you and give you a breakdown of what would fall in that function. So if you're ever curious where teachers are paid from or where guidance counselors fall into, that kind of helps you. And I, I didn't list every single one of them, but that's a, a broad category of who falls within those functions of expenditures. If you move on down, this starts the series of object codes that we were talking about. Your 0100 is your salaries, 0200 is your benefits, so it breaks it down by function and then it breaks it down by object code. And that object code is what we made those expenses. You know, what were they for? Were they for supplies? Were they for travel? Were they for computers? So this report will continue just like the revenues did. It will show you a month to date column. It will show you a year to date column and it will show you the budget appropriated. And then it will also give you a comparison to last fiscal year at that same, same time frame. So it breaks it down by instruction, which is your, basically your teachers and aides where they're paid from, your student support services, which is a lot of your attendance department, guidance counselors, uh, health services department. Then it moves into your instructional staff, which is uh, your technology, your media, your library, office of instruction. Then it moves down to the district admin, uh, which is community education, uh, your school board, superintendent office, The next function is school admin support, which is where your principals, assistant principals, the office staff, where they would fall into. 
Next is business support services. This is your finance and personnel. Then you go to 2600, which is plant operations and maintenance, which is your maintenance department. Then we move to 2700, which is student transportation, which is your transportation department. Um, next is listed as food service, but there's no food service from General Fund. That's Fund 51, uh, and I'll show you where that's located, but that's just how Munis groups this report. Um, next, community service. Normally, there'll not be anything within this section in the General Fund, but I did budget money there this year just because of May Valley's early child care where they've not been able to attend. So in case of general fund has to pick up the salary fringe of those employees there. Your next is your debt service 5100 and that's our KISTA bond payments. 5200 is fund transfers and that's the KETS match the general fund portion of the cats match and then uh, the bond payments that we have to make from the general fund and then last is contingency that's the amount that we have set aside in the general fund contingency so I'm not going to keep going over this but the same information will be generated and it goes by the next fund Fund two, special revenue. Then it will list the receipts. Then it lists the expenditures and the same function codes that we just went over. Okay, so I just highlighted them on your general fund. That way you had that information. Then the next fund that it pulls up is Fund 21, and that's that school activity fund, the district activity fund. Same way, it starts with your revenues, breaks those down, then expenditures. Fund 25, that's the, the new one that I was talking about. Um, there is some year-to-date information in there because I have imported into Munis what the schools have done as of uh, September 30th. I'm still reviewing all their December stuff. So and just know that this one right here is not up to date yet and that information um, as, of, as long as it's there by June 30. You know, the auditors kind of wanted just a one-time entry, but I want to make sure where it's a new fund that, that we were doing things properly and that uh, Everything worked out as needed. The next fund that pulls up is Fund 310, which is the capital outlay. It breaks it down, revenues, then expenditures. Next is Fund 320, which is your building fund. This is where you'll see um, the bond payments coming from. Uh, your next is Fund 360, which is our construction fund. So the projects that we currently have going, um, that's where those will be located. Next is debt service. We pay the bond payments through here and then we do a transfer to the fund 320. It's like a flow through account. A flow through account. Uh, KDE requires the payments to be made from here, then we have to do a journal to the other fund for those payments.
Fun 51. This was what I was talking about. This is your food service. Okay, so if you ever want to know food service, it's all within Fun 51, and it's going to locate, start with your revenues, and then the expenditures for food service. And then Fund 52, like I mentioned before, that's the May Valley Early Child Care, uh, your Allen and Prestonsburg after school programs. That's where uh, their budgets, revenues, and expenditures are located. I'm going to struggle back with this. So when you're reading that report, that's the main that's the main funds that it goes through. So does everybody understand and have a better understanding? on how to, to read that report. If you wouldn't mind, pull your balance sheet. I thought I had that saved in that drive, but I guess not. just walk us through with what you got okay. if we've all got one so your balance sheet it also breaks down by fund so you know when I did my presentation we talked about the balance sheet having an org code of two digits that's where that falls into that's why you see the two digits listed on the balance sheet um, so it groups your assets at the top then your liabilities and then your fund balance and it breaks it down by all those funds that we just talked about, uh, by your general fund, your special revenue fund. Uh, something to not be alarmed about, sometimes fund two will be in the negative. Um, it will show a cash balance of the negative. And the reason is our, our federal money, we have to request that. So it's like a reimbursement basis. So there's cer certain times that, you know, if we've not gotten any grant revenue, for instance, say state money, uh, that that may be in the negative because our federal money is on a reimbursement basis. So does anybody have any questions on the balance sheet? What's in Fun two, okay. yes, well, that's that's your main one. Um, what do we get reimbursed in? Well, that's your title money, that's your uh, special ed, idea money, any of our federal grants, title two, even your CARES money, the ESSER money, the GEARS money, all that money is on a reimbursement basis. Okay. Uh, a lot of times the state will go ahead and just send their money quarterly. Sometimes they'll give money up front. Right. Um, 
but that's mainly a big chunk of that you're going to see is that federal money that's on a reimbursement basis. And like I mentioned, Fund 25, that's as of September 30th. I've not had a chance to, to review their uh, December stuff yet. So does anybody have any questions on trying to read and understand the balance sheet? Okay, next. This is the orders of the treasurer. Uh, this is the report that I send out weekly. Uh, we try our best to send it out on Wednesday and then we ask for you all to respond uh, by Friday at the latest. That way we can issue checks on Monday. This is not the most recent one, but I wanted to show you if we have multiple payments, how it will accumulate everything we've paid previous on this warrant and then how it breaks down the, the current amount that we're asking approval for. So when you pull this up, this first page lists all the different vendors that we have paid. It lists the amounts that we have paid. It gives a comment of the description of what we've paid. And that gives a tally. Okay, when it's summarized like this, this is prior payments that we've made on this warrant. If you'll continue to scroll down, when you start seeing the detailed information, this is what we're getting approval on. This report breaks it down by the vendor. It has the org codes, so you can tell what school that it belongs to. It will have, if it's a grant, it'll be that four-digit code at the end. It has the amount. And she does separate warrants, too. She does a fund, too, for our grants, and then she does a general fund, and she also does a, a food service one. So you would receive separate, separate warrants. So sometimes when you get an email from us, it might have two of these on here, or it might have three, and that's why. It, it's broken down by, by fund. So this amount is what we sent, you know, for you all to review, to look over the vendors and make sure that you approve. The very last page will do a tally. It will tally what we've put current to be paid plus what we have paid. It will do a final grand total at the end. Because I know we had some confusion once we started sending those out. Um, on payments we'd already made. So that just hopefully breaks that down a little better for you all to understand that. So now I'm going to talk about just some revenue history. Um, this is the number format. You also have a chart, too, that you can follow along. Same information. just depends on how you want to see that information. If it's easier for you to see numbers or if it's easier for you to understand the charts. But something that I wanted to point out is our title money. Um, 
from fiscal year 17 all the way up to fiscal year 20, we took a decrease in title funds. We received less each fiscal year. Fiscal, fiscal year 21, we received a surplus of $2 million in title. So that's something that I want the board just to, to keep in mind. You know, if those funds ever decrease, and when they do, that's money that people are going to have to be go back to the general fund to be paid or from other sources. The next is the SEEK. If you'll look, you'll see besides fiscal year 18 that we've took a pretty big chunk, a cut in SEEK each fiscal year. Okay, so that's something else that I just wanted to point out so you could see, see the figures. You know, SEEK is your biggest uh, chunk of money that's coming into your general fund. Okay, next is the, the property tax. Your first column is going to show the total property tax that we collected for each of those fiscal years. We had to put a portion of the money that we receive into FSPK. So that's what that second column is. Third column is what the general fund, how much it actually received of those property taxes collected. Your last column is your increase or decrease from the previous fiscal year. This year we voted to not take the compensating tax rate um, and with the being in the middle of a pandemic, who knows? We've received three uh, tax payments so far. So what you're seeing in fiscal year 21 that's highlighted in yellow, that's what we have received to date in property taxes. The next section is motor vehicle. What's highlighted in yellow, fiscal year 21, is what we have received to date. $662,075.80. But it just shows you how that fluctuates from, from year to year. You know, last year we uh, went down 29000 compared to the previous fiscal year. And then last on the revenue history uh, is the delinquent tax collected. And with taxes, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a roller coaster. It's up, it's down. Um, so I just wanted you as a board to have these figures to see you know, how these numbers have fluctuated through the fiscal years. And like I said, these charts, it's the same information. It shows the title just in a chart form. It shows our seek money in the form. So you can see, you know, the increases and decreases. You can visually see that. And then your property taxes. talk about next was the projection amount of the race. Mm -hmm. I asked uh, Tiffany to prepare a 1%, a 2%, or a 3% raise, and uh, she has that information together for us here.
So when I put this projection together, I used the current staffing. I staffed everybody as if they were paid from the same place next fiscal year as they are this fiscal year. Um, but like I said, you know, you got two additional two million dollars additional in title this year. We're not sure, you know, what the allocation will be next fiscal year for this. But like I said, this is based on the exact same staffing as what we're currently in fiscal year 21. And that includes the vacancies we have, am I correct? Yes, that includes vacancies. This does not look at subs or anything. I'm going to pull that up in the, after this slide. But this is just your full-time full -time staff. So in your general fund, and when we talk about budgets, like I said, I'm normally always going to talk general fund to you. The normal step, if we didn't give a raise, that first column, the 25767 that's what the cost would be, which is normal step increases for the employees. And what I mean by step increase, um, if they're rank one 10 years, they move up to 11 years. So there are raises that's bumps in salaries that's already in the salary schedules. Uh, next, it breaks it down by what the fringe would be and then what the total cost. So we didn't give a raise, and everybody stayed paid from where they are right now, uh, 28 million 840,000 just for the cost in general fund for our current staff. Okay, if we gave a 1% raise, that's what the next line is. It breaks it down. How much the salary would be, how much the fringe, the total, of salary and fringe combined for an additional cost of 287974 If you were to give a 2%, it breaks it down by salary, fringe, total, and that would be an additional cost of the general fund of $575,950. Three percent raise would be an additional cost to the general fund of eight hundred sixty-three thousand nine hundred twenty-five. I also went ahead and broke this down for food service, um, so you would see what the additional cost would be to food service. Uh, so if we just kept all the cooks, all the staff uh, paid as they are now, with their bump and steps on the salary schedule, the cost would be two million twenty five thousand three hundred and eighty eight. If we were to give a one percent, the cost of food service would be twenty thousand two forty six. If we were to give a two percent, the cost of food service fund fifty one would be forty thousand four forty three. And a three percent to the food service fund would be $60,640. Okay, so the next part that I want to point out is down here at the bottom. This is everybody that's paid from your grants, your fund too. That's how much would be budgeted just in fund two to cover those people paid from, from grants. That if nobody came to the general fund, they stayed exactly how they are this fiscal year, that would be the salary cost in that grant. I have all these highlighted yellow to make a point. This right here, the fringe, is just your basic fringe, being the Medicare and uh, unemployment and teacher's retirement. What this does not include is the life insurance, health insurance, and admin fee that we had to pay for every employee paid from a federal grant. Um, also, any employee paid from a federal grant is a higher uh, teacher's retirement. It's 3% from the general fund or from a state grant for teacher's retirement for an employee, 
or it's 16.105 percent anybody pay for my federal grant for teachers but what that the additional amount that I do not have on here it goes by employee whatever the state contribution rate is of the health insurance they choose that's the monthly rate that we have to charge to this grant if they're paid a portion from this grant whatever portion we have to whatever percentage we have to charge there um, so you you've got a vast uh, variety of different rates you know you can have an employee with a family plan that can be a thousand dollars a month or you can have somebody with a single plan that could be much cheaper so that's why I did not put a number and predict everything because especially right now January insurance rates changed if people chose sometimes they can choose flex which is a, a very cheap amount it's $175 a month um, people go from flex to health insurance they'll go from health insurance to flex so it's always um, very variable on what those additional amounts would be but I just wanted you all to see these amounts does not include any of that the health insurance life insurance or the admin amount I know just one number, but there is a $60 wrong here. What $60 is here. $60? Yeah, okay. the number here. One person and two person, his calculation is wrong. It's $60 more. Okay. Right there. 40,443 should be 44,993. Okay. Well, it's all on Excel it's on and it's exported into wrong. here. So does anybody have any questions on on this and I just want to now just show you some additional costs that the district can incur you know as far as our subs go um, and kind of a breakdown of general fund subs and excess time Coach got a question. If they just, whatever raise we give will be across the board. Is that right? If that's what all employees. That's what we've you know normally done. That's what you figured it on. Yes, right. that's the, yeah. that's my figures was every classified, every certified employee getting a one percent raise or two percent or three percent. So the last uh, thing that, that you have is a handout. I just want you to see um, the cost to the district, the general fund. Um, this is broke down per fiscal year on certified subs, how much we paid in certified subs through, through the fiscal years. And I want to point out just how much the district is saving right now where teachers are are virtual and we don't need subs uh, plus we were paying some of our subs um, if employees were off due to COVID from our uh, CARES money so so far this fiscal year we've only coded thirteen thousand two hundred thirty dollars in certified subs so I just want you to see once we do get back into school and things go back to normal what some of those costs can be for subs Uh, then the, the ne uh, next is broke down by the general fund classified subs so what you see now as far as the classified subs that we're paying that's basically uh, bus drivers and and food service but again just want to point out you know we've been pretty consistent 300 200,000 in subs 
right now we're at 39,000, so just, you know, just because we're, we're virtual. Classified excess time. Um, I want you to see how these numbers have fluctuated through the years, but right now, um, with the bus drivers not doing the extra runs like they used to, or where we've not had the sports like we did, and um, so that's why you see that numbers down quite a bit this fiscal year. And then you've got overtime, and you can see our numbers a little up at this point in time, but that is a lot of the, the drivers, the overtime they were working when we were doing the meal deliveries. Uh, just something else to keep in mind, uh, the general fund budget, you know, besides the regular salaries to um, certify classified employees, the salaries that we pay our subs, we also uh, budget each fiscal year $441,500 in supplemental funds. And that's broken down per school level, and that's for your coaches. That's for your uh, ESS people. That's for your chairs at the school, um, whatever those supplemental positions happen to be. And then the last thing that I want to point out that's something that you don't see flow through payroll but affects payroll quite a bit as a fringe is work comp amounts. And those work comp amounts will fluctuate um, every year just depending on if we've had a big payout, a big settlement. Um, so that's just numbers that I want everybody to visually see so they have information to, to make the best decision that they can. But other than that, that's all the information that I have to present. That was a lot. That was a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that was good. You do a good job of that. Thank, Thank you God. very much. Thank, Thank you, Tiff. Um, any discussion? I'm sorry. I've stepped on your toes again. <laughs> questions or wish to discuss this while we've got everybody here and Matt's back there in the back I see now if, if I'm from what, what what I've been told by um, other attorneys is that we can't take any action but we can well you guys can let me know what you want on the agenda right. for, for this right. But you can't have an open discussion right now about this. Right. This is strictly a work session. Yes, yes. I would like for us to give as much as possible, whatever you think we can afford. If it's only 1%, which is an extra cost of 287000 I know we gave this last year, which was approximately the same amount as I remember. And, and if we do only go with 1%, uh, I think we ought to revisit that next year also. Look at the revenue coming in and see what we can afford uh, next year also. How does, that, how does that play in with what the governor has discussed about a, a raise? Well, now, the governor proposes a budget, and, and what he's proposed is a $1,000 raise for, for each teacher, okay? Now, that budget has to go to the House and the Senate. And um, without getting into too many politics, we know there's a supermajority. Um, he's probably not going to get everything he wants in that budget. I know last year he proposed, uh, can anybody recall what he 2, proposed? 000. Was it 2000 for teacher? And yeah. it didn't make it in the budget. So that, uh, I'm very skeptical that that will make it in the budget. I have a question. Uh-huh. 
I know I read the governor the state of email. Mm -hmm. The way he mentioned about how much he was going to raise the money, uh, salary. So that money, when we raise the our money, or governor raising the money for the school employees, then will come money, extra money come for we will give from our money. Well, he's included in his one year budget. So it would be for one year if it's approved by the legislature, by the House and the Senate. Yeah, it would be in that one-year budget. And see, that's the scary thing about, uh, I won't call it a mandated raise, but a, a raise that they put into the budget is next budget cycle, it may not be in there, and the district has to pick it up. Right. If the district has to pick it up, then it's, you know, it becomes a financial burden on the district. Um, the superintendent meetings I had today, uh, a lot of the lobbyists were saying that they would rather see that money be put into the base seat formula uh, because that can't be changed after it's put in there. Mm -hmm. And my, Matt may be able to explain that a little better. We had a little discussion about it earlier. But if that money's put directly into the base seat, then that's a guarantee every year. Am I correct, Matt? Based on, based on the, the seat formula. Rate we got 500 teachers, that's half a million dollars. Uh, if they don't put that in the seat formula, they put it as a line item in the budget, and then next year there's significant revenue shortfalls on the state level, and they're going to be looking at kicking that back to the districts, and that's significant. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, the range costs that go along with it. Right now, the uh, classified retirement system is at 2409, looking at going at 2695. So you're looking at 2% increased cost on the classified staff next year, whether it, and not one penny of it goes to the staff, it all goes to the retirement system. So that's going to be a significant impact on your budget anyway. Uh, not discouraging you from doing a raise by any means, but that's going to mean that a 1% raise is going to cost over three, because you're going to have nearly a 3% increase on, in, on top of the current existing salaries. And if you increase it at 1%, then you're 3% on top of that. So those are going to be uh, a significant impact. So when you get back to the to the seat formula, if they put that in that seat base, they typically won't go backward. And I don't know what they ever have, but they've been flat several years, where it did not change, and and they they, they don't give you any more money in the other fund. Uh, Tiffany was talking about the uh, title title one going up two million. That's awesome. But the thing with that is, is that that's a funding clip. Once that money's gone, if they go back and we don't get that two million and all that two million we spent, we're either going to have to cut two million or we're going to have to uh, have the general fund subsidize of that. And that's significant. And if you remember back from the last time we had the, the, uh, the stimulus monies, uh, there was a big funding clip there. We always take the money in title and special ed and we hired extra people for that two years. We had to go. So the general fund can't pick that down up. The same thing's going to happen with the rates and just to be aware. When you have your fund too, your, your uh, state and federal grants are a fine out of money. If you increase the salary cost in those, they may be up to absorb it if they've got other other expenditures in there like supplies or whatever by cutting them. If not, if it's a fine out of money and it causes the cost to go more than what the grant is, the general fund has to pick that up. So there's a, there's a, there's a few factors that y'all need to consider. Um, financially, this is not I don't see any problem with doing what you want to do. Uh, we'll, we've always made it work with the to do that. But I know it's a long answer to a short question, but, but those are things I just think y'all need to consider. And uh, any, of this, any of this money that we've got for CARES, the GEAR money, the ESSER money, it's all kind of, it, it follows the Title I uh, guidelines. We almost have to spend it in those manners. They give us a, 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 a I guess we'll say a rubric as to how we can go about spending that money. We have to check boxes before we can spend that money. So it's not, I mean, we're getting ready to get, we're getting ready to get a whole handful of money. It's probably posted right now. They said it was going to be posted on the webcast. Yeah, I mean, and it's going to be, it's going to be a big, a significant amount of money. Uh, they said probably three to four times what we got the last time, Tiffany, what did we get the last time? 800,000? It was a million. It was a million. So I mean, we're looking at getting a pocket full of money, but that money has to be focused on, uh, 
monitoring and finding the gaps caused by COVID and how we're going to, uh, how we're going to bring those kids back up to speed. Now, we had planned and we were ready to use last summer before COVID that we wanted to bring students in uh, our early, not early childhood, but really our elementary age students. We want to use uh, STEM activities to get them here that we're going to focus on reading and math. Because research has shown out in Kansas, I, I picked this up at a conference, but in Kansas they, they have done that and they were able to uh, increase students scores their reading levels uh, just it was unbelievable what they could do through that summer through that program so those are the things that we're going to have to look at doing with this money try to catch our kids up make sure they're ready to get started back in the fall or whatever they're going to do so many times that we get the special days and we hire personnel they ask us not to hire coaches. Right, right. I was wondering, even though I know Tyler Warren does help, but just to be careful. You know, Coach mentioned across the board, right? Uh, does it have to be across the board? Like, like he makes it a 100%. And I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to leave anybody out. Just, just say certified. Most certified people make it even worse. So many classified people do not make it. When you do like a one percent rate for certified and a three percent, I don't know. I'm just asking a question. But it's classified. Is that is that is that something that's possible? Well, yeah. Well, certainly you can if you're going to cause a divide. Right, and I, I, I do not want that. I've, I've had a lot of, a lot of people, you know, some, some classified. Now let's look at like this. What's a 1% raise going to add to the general side? And you're still early in the fiscal year. Like I said, we've got three uh, 
tax collection payments now, property tax. You know, it's still early in the ballgame to even project out what a fund balance will be. Uh, you know, our interest, uh, we had to sign a new contract we did with the community trust. Uh, our interest rate went down tremendous compared to what we had before. Uh, so it's just things to keep in mind. Uh, we're still early in the ballgame, and I feel, you know, later down the road we can get a more accurate fund balance. I think that the best option right now would be to just go ahead and come to the agenda to discuss slash approve the rate. And then that night you guys determine what you what you want to do. Uh, she gave so much information today. Yeah. So we can just go and do our homework yeah. and we know more in our mind what to do. And that way it's on the agenda. And it's either discussed or approved. Safe by safe, that we'll have it on the agenda to discuss, approve. Uh, I'll just say, raise, I'll meet some across the board. I'll leave that, you know. Well, the, the main thing is, is Tiffany is back there in charge, not put you on spot, Tiffany, but <laughs> it's 1% feasible across the board as far as what you see. What you see, or I know you're confused as far as what might be next year, but are you looking at something feasible? I personally err on the side of, of caution. Um, I try to be very conservative. And after I took this position after Matt, I, I've even asked him when he's sitting, I'm like, did this ever happen while you were here? Did this ever happen while you were here? And it, it, it kind of makes me panic a little bit when I see those six figures keep going down and down. And then I worry from my standpoint looking at the seat down the road what's happening with their uh, AAD Act you know are we having students transfer to other districts you know is, is that going to go down is our seat going to be less there's just in my opinion so many things that's unpredictable at this time uh, but that that's that's not are you saying the low river school is here or or Jump or wait to see. I myself personally would wait a little farther, closer to the end of the fiscal year to where we can see where we truly stand. But that's my opinion. Well, let me ask you this: Will there, when will things stabilize that we, you know, that we could make a better decision? Maybe. 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 And I don't want to say my opinion's known, but you know, I've done this for 24 years. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I again, this predicting the fund balance right now mid years, like uh, Jimmy Neal trying to predict the weather about three months from now. Uh, there's so many unknowns. This this COVID didn't actually is just who knows anything anymore. It doesn't matter if it's school district, city, county governments, it doesn't matter. There, there's just a lot of unknowns. Uh, from a standpoint of operations, uh, the, the finance side of it, we're good because we're, we've not been in school. We've not been turning the lights on as much. We've not been running the water. We've not been doing all those things. Uh, from staffing, just like you talked about with substitute salaries, all those substitute salaries are down. They are creeping up every year. And we're pushing $700,000 a year on substitute costs. And to me, that just uh, it drives me back. But those costs are not there this year. So we've got that right now. What happens next year when we get back to the session? What happens with all this extra money that they're sending to us to do extra things with goes away? So there are a lot of unknowns. Uh, but like I said, and, and, and Kim knows it too, and, and she's taking a position I've taken sitting right here years ago, you know that, uh, that we got to err on the side of conservative because we don't want this issue to get back to say it was in the 90s. You know, and I mean, that was, you know, coming here in 1998, it's $321,000 deficit. All right, we've got a healthy fund about a better cent. But on the same side of it, we all understand that folks are, it's hard to live in Eastern Kentucky. It's hard to make a living. And that's why in 2018, 
we instituted a ten dollar minimum for everybody in the district. Now, if you look at surrounding districts, not all of them have that. So our starting pay for classified folks is a lot higher, but it's still not enough, and we know that. Um, so should we wait? That's your own call. If you all want to make it happen, we'll make it happen. But what, what, and it'll be okay this year. But there may be some tough decisions ahead for you all in, uh, in, in future years because of doing that. Yeah, but we can't on that issue. It may be all, all roads. Nobody has a crystal ball. That's right. We don't know. What we do is make the best of a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And that's what typically we've always done. But again, from the finance side of it, you got to think of the service side. You know, I'm going to take a roll now. I'm going to see things a little different. And see both sides of it. And, and, it, and, and sometimes it's hard for me to swallow because Lynn knows, knows more than anybody here does. It's, uh, it, you, you got to do what's right to make sure that the district stays solvent for kids. And, and that it has to be the primary focus. But we can't teach kids if we ain't got people. You know, we are in a people business. That's what school districts do. We hire people, we go out and provide a service. We don't build a thing. Everything we got is intangible. So we've got to have those people. We've got to, we've got to have good people. And you can't be a good people don't make it. It can happen, but like I say, I, I mean, I, I, I signed the gift on it, but we'll make it happen if, if that's what y'all do. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank Our students can go to any district surrounding us that they want to, and if uh, you can see there, there's information in there as well that will uh, tell you, yes, if you'll find the, the email from Maggie, um, it tells you how many students are going to Johnson County, how many students are entering from Johnson County, how many students are going to Paintsville Independent, how many are, in, are entering the district, Knott County, McGoffin County. And if you'll look all the way down through there, probably, probably our, our, um, we are seeing our largest loss is going to Johnson County right now, uh, which we get 18 from Johnson County. And, and what happens is that uh, you know we can we can set set these boundaries to be what they what what, we, what the what the board wants them to be. Um, it looks like this year the total monies that followed the students that that went out of district is a million three hundred sixty thousand dollars. Now, if we decide to change this reciprocating agreement, let, let's say you decided to shut it completely off, that doesn't mean we get that money. Okay, that money just doesn't go to those districts. 
Now, what's going to end up happening is eventually uh, those students will start coming back and they're going to stop leaving because the other districts will stop taking them. So, with that being said, Lawrence County enacted a one-to-one. -one. That means if one of our students goes to Johnson County and we get one of theirs, then that money follows the students. Uh, if, if two of our students go to Pike County and two of theirs come here, then that money follows. But if it gets, if Pike County gets five and we only get two, then they only get the money for two. But we don't get, we don't get the money. But they don't either. But we lose. Yes, we do lose the money. We don't. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think it looks like, right, like I said, if you look ahead, Johnson County's got 146, Pinesville 63, Knott County 9. We actually get more kids from Knott County than we do. So, and you can be selective about it. Because if you see, it looks like that's what Lawrence did with Pinesville Independent. But you can be selective about it. You can, uh, uh, you know, look at McGoffin County. We, we do better for McGoffin County than we lose. Pike County, we lose 80 students, if you do the math. We get 46 from them, they get 126 of ours. So that's, again, there's no action we can be taking. I wanted to put that information into your hands. Um, now, we do have to take some action, and we have to get that turned in. Probably need to do something on the board meeting the 25th, because we actually, it's supposed to have been done maybe, maybe in December, I'm not sure. But last year, if we recall, we were about this time of year doing it. On the reciprocal. Yes. A decision, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So do we know what impact it had on Lawrence County? I do not. I can ask, I can I can get with Robbie and he can tell me that. It'd be interesting. And yeah. uh, we can see. But I think Robbie was losing a lot of students to Johnson County as well. Yeah. On that yeah. upper end there in Lawrence County. So there's that information, and uh, you know, I, and that's just an example. You could, like I know, some districts have limited it to, well, you can have a hundred of ours, or like I know one district that allows an independent district to have approximately 300 students, or you can you can completely cut off. Now, anything we do, my recommendation is going to be that whoever's there is already there. Right. They're grandfathered in. I agree with that. I mean, we, we, we're not going to pull students back. We can't do that. But what we can do is starting from the effective date uh, when the new reciprocating agreement would start, probably August, nobody after that or, you know, that. That's the way it would work. I can see also, though, you, you, that within that one family, you may have somebody that's ready to go out of mm -hmm. the district. So how, do, how would that affect? It could, however you guys want it to. Whatever you guys decide. We typically say that if, you, if you're there and uh, you got a sibling there that everybody stays, but I mean, it's. I'm clear. talking about if you've got a, a senior in, or an eighth grader or a senior in, or a junior in high school, but mm -hmm. you got a kindergartner getting ready to start. Yeah. Again, you all because we would have one in one system and one in the other. We'll have to decide on that. You just tell us what you like, and uh, John Earl can write it up. Okay. Isn't that right, John Earl? That's correct, sir. <laughs> I didn't know if you could hear me or not. I was, that was a hearing test there. Okay. So this does have to go on the the 25th yes. agenda. Okay. You can opt to leave it the same uh, with the open borders. That's That's completely up to you guys. So do we have any discussion from any of the other board members on that? Any have have we reached out to, for example, 146 students that we lost to Johnson County? Have we, have we talked to their parents and asked them what made Johnson County schools so much more appealing? We did that. Ford Was County that last year we did that? And what, what we run into in Pike County, the hospital? A lot of folks are going up there to work and they're just taking their kids with them. Johnson County on that lower end, what we're seeing is it's the kids that are closer to, what is that school? Is it Porter, Porter. Elementary that's yes. right there on the Floyd County line? Uh, we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, just different things, Ms. Smallwood. It's not a lot of people. 
pipe wind dependents the same way. Uh, they get a lot of them simply because of the uh, of the uh, hospital up there. And folks going up there to work. And athletics. And athletics, yes. Yeah, but they're not all playing ball. <laughs> <laughs> Those are just the ones that we see on Facebook and hear about them. <laughs> I mean, the, there, there's an underlying reason behind think, uh, why we're losing kids. And I'm just like, no way to do Yeah. That, that's, that's why I hate it. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's what we have found is, is many times it's work or... or I, I know from where I live at, it takes... I can be to Ledger Center quicker than I can be to Floyd Center. I can be to Shelby Valley quicker than I can be to Floyd Center. I can be to Jenkins quicker than I can be to Floyd Center. Yet my kids would attend Floyd Center. Uh, and there are people that live closer to Shelby Valley than I do that live in Floyd County. Uh, the travel time is it's pretty bad. Yeah. You know, if you get on a bus at 620 and to go to school at Floyd Center, that's an issue. And and, and I know that's an issue because I, when I was going door to door and talking to people, that was a major complaint on that end of Lake Fever. And then when I went to the other end of Lake Fever, I talked to parents there and they were saying the same thing. Put the child on the bus at 6.20 to go to school and it's starting at 8. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's something that that maybe we can make our schools a little more appealing some way. And I don't know what the answer to it is. You know, maybe we can find out if, there, if we can possibly hire more drivers, whatever. But we've got to look at something. Anybody else? wonder if the principals at a particular school would know. Would, would that not be a good place to start? To we, maybe? Well, like I said last oh, no. year, I'm pretty sure Pam and, and uh, she had a committee that called the okay. parents that had left. Do we, so it mainly yeah, had to do these, with... Look, a lot of these students right here, uh -huh. what, what these numbers are, these are folks that live in Floyd County uh -huh. but don't attend school in Floyd County now. Several of these kids have never attended school in Floyd County. Right. Several of them have never gone to school in Fort County. And we found that out through the calls, too. Okay. So most of it had to do with work-related work related, reason? yeah. reasons? That's, and then uh, close proximity to their home yeah. on that lower end there, yeah. yeah. And really, you've got Betsy Lane. What's it, Coach? Ten minutes from Mullins mm -hmm. and Pikeville. Yeah. I know last year, coaches wanted to build the wall. We'll put the wall on that side. <laughs> I think we both were. Yeah. 
Okay. So, so do we? Are we just not going to say we already know why they're leaving and, and that's it? I mean, we're not going to. We're well, just I mean, going to look at the reciprocal agreement. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can have, I can try to have Christine and them call again. Um, whatever you guys wish us to do. But I think it was just last year we did that. Right. And I know Dr. Webb had had him do that, what, probably two years before I came. I was thinking well, that yeah. we did, yes. Mm -hmm. Last year, I, I know, this going to different districts, but last year we did not lose that many students. Yeah. Last year we gained. Last, mm -hmm. year, last year we gained. Gain of 50 students, we, we didn't lose last year. We've gained a few, yeah. We have. You know, I'm just going, there's a whole number. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. last year we were 15 numbers more. We were up 50 at one point, yeah. Maybe even a little, little more of that at the beginning of the school year. Yes. Okay, and so this there. One, this one, leaving her county, Hesselhorn, I was a board member, the same for Johnson County. We leaving so many students from Johnson County. It's the only that I remember. And some of that has to do with going to Tanksville Independent, where it's a smaller school. A lot of, you know, sometimes that's the reason. I mean, just looking for a smaller system or a school system. Okay, so we will put this on the 25th regular board meeting then. Yep. Okay, so now the next thing is to discuss a hiring freeze. And uh, I'd like to just open the floor for discussion on that. Are these positions, uh, I don't, uh, extremely necessary? I mean, I mean, what, 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 chief special education officer? What, what, what is that? That is the director of the special education program. Um, what we have is Mr. Begley was our director for the last two years, and done an excellent job. Uh, when I came here. We inherited a corrective action plan from KDU, and uh, we spent about a year and a half working through that to get out from under it, which we just got out from under this summer. Uh, so we, uh, it's already budgeted in. Miss Miss Duncan, you've been here how long? Have we ever gone without a special education director of special education? Anything that we post are vacancies. You all are the only ones that can create positions. We can't. Okay. Anything that we post are, is something that people have have either been terminated or resigned, um, retired, anything along those lines. So those are not created positions. Those no, were all, I, those were those were existing. We can't do positions. that. Yeah, you all are the only ones that can create positions. Okay. Yeah, those are existing mm -hmm. positions. One of those retired. One of those retired. Um, retired we land. we did, and then we term we had to terminate, terminate someone. Yes, there was a termination, and then there was a, uh, a retire. So it's not adding any new people. No, no, new it's position. just it's it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, let me see what the numbers are. We've got 25 total in that pro in that department. We have 18 maintenance techs, and that's counting actually four vacancies that we have, uh, not counting the director and, yeah, the director. So that's, yeah. So, so that money's already appropriated for the special ed. Uh, from, from what I've been seeing, uh, isn't there anybody, and I know everybody works hard, and does a fun, fantastic job, but does, does the, is there anybody in, in central office that could step in and do this job? No. I mean, do, do you have? We don't have anyone that has that time or that 
I mean, this is uh, yeah. what's the budget? Do you not have anyone qualified? We do have someone qualified, but they have other duties they're doing. They've got a job. So you couldn't consolidate it? No. Uh, I mean, what's the budget, Angela, for the special ed department? So we're saying there's nobody else that can assume those duties or any other duties being shifted around so that we would not have to. Uh, it would, or how much money would we save as a district if we did not fill this position and let somebody else step into that? Or would we be saving any at all because it comes from ideal? It doesn't have anything to do with general fund. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any more remarks about uh, the about the hiring then? Is everybody satisfied that those positions are going to be filled and um, and that they're from vacancies? Are there any more comments? I do, Ms. Gearhart. Okay. Since uh, since the agenda came out, we've had a ton of calls about the hiring freeze. Okay. Schools want to know are we not going to be able to fill our vacancies and that type of thing. So, you know, it did send a little shock through the through the district. And then, you know, Saturday night, I received. You know, an email from you that, mm -hmm. that I took as a director. Um, so it, as part of my duties is to protect the board and the, and the district, like what you and I talked, mm -hmm. um, I reached out to some education attorneys, not not Mr. Hunt, because he's your guy's attorney. He's, right. he's not mine. And uh, they, they actually had some concerns with a hiring freeze, especially when you're discussing a raise, but you cite budgetary concerns as a hiring freeze. Mm -hmm. uh, they felt like that could almost be seen as overreaching into personnel. Okay, but if I think you, if you look at it, it states that until the 25th to the board meeting, the new board meeting. Right. Which it, was just for the new members to get a handle on what was going on. It had nothing to do with your authority or our authority or anything. It simply was just asking you to wait. Well, I mean, I didn't read it that way. Well, that's the way it was intended, I assure you, because I don't have the ability to hire anybody. That's right, you don't. You don't have the ability to make this decision on your own. Uh, that and was not it has a decision. To be done in an open meeting. That was just a, uh, a uh, just an email to you discussing the hiring freeze that I'd already asked for you to be put on the you that you to you agreed agenda. to put on the, the agenda. I did. Okay. But and that was just a follow up. The director. But anyway, it's well, neither here nor there. How many other positions are are you looking at hiring? Because uh, you said that you, that you built a, 
a call from principals concerned about crime? Yeah, we've got. How, uh, how many more positions are we looking at filling? We've got uh, bus drivers right now that uh, substitutes. Just give me a number. Ten or twelve, I would imagine. Okay. I was just looking at it because I'm interested in the raise portion of it. So, how many are certified? Would you say? Just the one? Probably just the one. Just four. the one? So, so the other ones that haven't been posted? Yeah. So right now there's just four? Okay. And we do have, I know the gift and talented is, is a federal requirement to spend that money. We have to post it. So that, that's, the, that's the long and short of it. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to make this statement. Anything that I do, uh, anything I ask of you or any other board member, members here is to help keep this school system running and to keep it uh, fiscally uh, uh, sovereign like, we, like it says, one of our goals is. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that if we spend money uh, like it's never going to run out. And, I, and from what I'm hearing from our uh, finance people is that we're in good shape as of today. But that doesn't mean we're going to be that way tomorrow. And I will always be in favor of saving money so, that it, so we don't have to lose programs or people in the future. And, um, if, you know, when I send you something like I send you and you've got a problem with it, you need to contact me then and not sit and stew on it. I didn't stew on it. It sounds Ms. like Gerard. you did. It sounds like you did. Okay. Well, and I'll work with you. I'm, I'm and I'm willing to work. Way. Well, <laughs> that remains to be seen. But I've sat here and I've took a back seat for two years, Mr. Atkins, and I will not be silent anymore. You've had a voice for two years? I tried to. I tried to, and I think you know exactly what I mean. So I'm not angry, and I'm not bitter, but I am for the Floyd County Schools as long as I'm sitting here. And I will work it with you, and I've told you that before. Okay. And I have tried my best to work with everybody I can. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this disconnect's coming from. Things like what you just did today about contact and not contacting me first about the email and stuff. We've always tried to to communicate, I thought. I thought so too. Then you, well, you know, you send me that email that's a direct That went to you. Well, it didn't, it went to you. This is place to discuss that. Well. <laughs> anyway, the other attorneys had, now, they had, several, no, other, they had several other issues with it well, more than what I just discussed. Well, it was checked, believe me, before it was sent. But anyway, moving right on, do we have any other things to discuss? Okay, some things are going to be uh, held over to our uh, next regular board meeting. And I guess the, as far as the raise and things like that, we'll discuss that at, at that time then too. We have a motion to adjourn, I guess, or do we need a motion? At this I point? don't know. That, was that on there on the agenda? It says adjourn. We better go ahead and do that just to I'll be make safe. A motion, we adjourn. Okay. I'll second. Okay. okay. We better do that to be safe.